I rode carefully in the evening traffic, heading through London towards the Marriott Hotel. My head was filled with thoughts of murder and all sorts of atrocities, which I considered as an appropriate response to my situation. Whatever happened in the next few hours, at least three people's lives would never be the same again, and it was still debatable how many would have any life at all after this night. My name is Sal, short for Salvatore. I am of Italian descent. My parents have lived in the UK since the late 1960s. The family business is a ubiquitous Italian restaurant that has been a mainstay of my family and the many cousins and others that make up the extended portion of it. We're a close-knit bunch when it comes down to it, but unlike past times, we're not involved in each other's lives on a daily basis. Family events are always well attended, and no one wants to be the one who is not where they should be and suffer from the gaze of my grandmother matriarch, who always needs to be obeyed. Despite everything, I married Connie seven years ago. We were both about 30 years old at the time. It seemed like we were brought together after being in a relationship that was going nowhere, and in some ways, while fulfilling, it didn't have what it takes to be in a long-term relationship. We dated, hung out, and had fun for almost two years before we took the plunge and got married. My grandmother never had warm feelings for Connie. She seemed to almost tolerate it, that's all. She was never outright rude, but there was always an air of mistrust as she looked at Connie, as if she was waiting for her to somehow cross the line, almost as if she had her finger on the trigger, waiting for it to happen. How do women know or feel all this? That beats me. At times, she had difficulty hiding her feelings for my wife, but she never expressed her opinion in front of others. She told me shortly before we got married, You keep an eye on Sal. She has looks. Be careful and always guard your heart. That was all she said, but for some reason her words played in the background in my mind as I made my way through the traffic-filled streets of London. There was no need to rush. I knew exactly where I was going, and if there were any events or changes in my evening, I would be notified by text message or cell phone call. I joined the traffic on Marylebone Road. As usual, it was still quite busy, even though it was after 9 p.m. The bright lights of the city shone on the dark streets. I turned toward the city center, and it seemed to me that my heart and breathing were quickening. It won't be long now, I thought to myself. Then this farce will be over. A month ago, I found out that my wife was dating a guy and had sex regularly. Well, at least once every two weeks. I found out after some searching that this went on for at least six months. How did I know about this? It was actually easy. Much easier than I would have thought. One night she made a tiny mistake that made me think that all was not well. It was all so simple. The day I found the pen, it was one of those cheap ones that hotels provide as welcome kits. I couldn't figure out where it came from. I know I haven't stayed at this particular hotel before. I always use a well-known network when I have to travel, which is usually once a month. I accumulate loyalty points, but not that many. Anyway, one evening, I asked Connie if she had a pen, and she fished it out of her bulky purse. As soon as I finished using it, I saw the writing, and a little alarm bell went off in my head. I knew I hadn't stayed there and couldn't think of any reason why my wife would have a pen from that hotel, so I was a little puzzled. Connie silently put the pen back in her bag. I didn't say anything, but decided that I needed to look into it and see if there was anything there that I should worry about. It may have been small and insignificant, but it was a tiny crack in our marriage that turned out to be the source of catastrophic consequences. I can't explain why, but at the time I just put it out of my mind and didn't dwell on it when we met up with friends for food and drinks. It was somewhat of a routine that we would occasionally meet up with two other couples to grab a bite to eat and then enjoy a few drinks and dance at the end of the evening. We were sitting in the lounge bar of our favorite restaurant when the infamous pen appeared. It was our usual place. Cozy, relaxed, with a relaxed atmosphere. It didn't hurt that it was run by one of my cousins, so of course there was a nice family discount, which my own family in turn reciprocated. The discounts were just enough to show respect, but not enough to offend the owner. Respect was given and received. It was a two-way thing that worked. The other two couples were Carlo and his wife, Joanna, and Phil and his wife, Terry. 
Carlo and Joanna were about five years or so older than us. Of course, we were connected from a distance, but we were still family. Carlo was a little old-fashioned in some respects, and he led an interesting life, although not everything was legal. He was a real beer, and I remember when Connie first met him he terrified her, but you couldn't ask for a nicer, kinder, gentler man. That is, as long as you don't upset him. One word, don't. Carlo was like an older brother to me. He was always there, kept me out of trouble, and once or twice dealt with a problem or two with ease. His wife, Joanna, was a sweet lady. She adored Carlo, and they were perfect for each other. He was large, she was petite, pretty, but at the same time daring. She was the only person Carlo was afraid of. He adored her and didn't care who knew about it. I met Phil through work, and we seemed to get along really well. He was the same age as me and had similar views on life. We played golf together from time to time and hung out at the golf club with his wife, Terry. So it was actually good. Terry got along with Connie, and they often spent days away from home, spending huge amounts of money buying God knows what. And it took a lot of time. All I ever saw were the big bags that came through the door with Connie, after one of these expeditions. Where Phil was always warm and friendly, Terry seemed distant at times, and that was especially true lately. She then seemed to come to her senses and became part of the group. I often thought there was something wrong with her and told Connie about it more than once, but she just shut down with the usual girl problems that seemed to bubble up when a woman doesn't want to explain something. We were sitting in the living room, sipping cocktails, when Carlo and Joanna walked in. I stood up and greeted him as we all hugged and exchanged kisses. The waiter brought fresh drinks to our table within a minute of Carlo and Joanna joining us. Connie was always amazed at how well we were taken care of wherever we went. My cousin knew there were six of us and indicated that our table was ready. We were shown to our usual corner table, secluded, but with a view of the door, something Carlo always insisted on wherever he went. We didn't ask him why. Will Phil and Terry come? Joanna asked Connie. I spoke to her earlier, and she said they were definitely coming, but they might be a little late since Phil hadn't returned home yet. Carlo simply looked at the two women and turned his gaze to me. I looked at him and he just quietly shook his head. I let it slide, but I'll ask Carlo about it later. As we finished our first round of drinks, Phil and Terry appeared. They both looked a little flushed, but there was something else going on. Carlo just looked at them, his face expressionless. It was emotionless. I saw that look again, that he could know there was definitely something there. We sat down and were soon talking about work, our daily routines, and the usual banter with families and children. After an excellent dinner, we walked back into the living room and music filled the air. By this time, all the girls were eager to get out on the dance floor and work off some of the calories they had just eaten. We three guys sat for a while, sipping another round of cocktails and chatting nonstop discussing sports, of course, and admiring the eye candy performance in front of us. Our wives were giggling and having fun. The dance floor was busy to the point where it was getting crowded. There was a lively crowd here tonight. Nothing outrageous or out of control, just people having a good time. The girls staggered back to our table and downed their drinks as the music changed to a slower tempo. This was a signal for us to do our duty and escort them. I felt Connie press herself against me and gyrate her hips, causing her to smile at me. She continued her efforts, and I was planning ahead on how to take her home for some good sex. Carlo led Joanna back to the table after the first number, and when I looked back, I saw Phil and Terry were still on the dance floor, but they seemed a little awkward around each other. Are these two okay? I whispered to Connie. Yes, I think so. Terry didn't say anything. I looked again. Something was definitely wrong here. Connie pulled me away and did her best to distract me. We returned to the table. Carlo just smiled at me, and Joanna giggled. Phil and Terry approached the table. Terry grabbed her purse and announced that she was going to the toilet, which signaled the exodus of women, leaving us three guys sitting and looking at each other. Is everything okay, Phil? Carlo asked coldly. Yes, of course, without problems. Although, 
Maybe this is too much. He raised his glass and motioned for another serving. A fresh set of drinks arrived before the women even returned from their conference. Terry slid into the booth next to Phil. Their body language gave them away. Connie looked at me. There was something in her look that told me that all was not well here, and she looked away. Stairs surrounded us as we tried our best, not to mention the elephant in the room. Carlo pushed me with his knee under the table. I looked back, and he winked at me. He knows something. A few more dances, changing partners as we usually did, helped ease the tension until it was time to leave. My cousin called a taxi at the prearranged time, and we prepared to leave. I looked around and saw Connie talking to Phil across the room. They seemed animated, but at the same time they made a conscious effort to look cool. My mind marked this as another oddity of the evening, and I thought I'd ask her about it later, but maybe not. We said goodbye, and taxis took us in different directions. So what's the story with Phil and Terry? I asked directly. Nothing. Everything is all right with them. She smiled and then looked out the window at the lights passing by. I sat quietly, not for the first time thinking that something was wrong here. I didn't know what, but something was happening. I decided that I would contact Carlo in the morning. That night, Connie kept trying to make love to me, even though I had so much alcohol in me that I was horny as hell and giving in as hard as I could. She seemed insatiable. Wow, it was amazing, baby. We must do this again and as soon as possible. She smiled at me. I hope you remember that I love you and want this again and again, Sal. I love you, Sal, and don't forget it. I looked at her and she seemed strange to me. There was just a hint of something in it, but I couldn't figure out what it was. I love you too, baby. Never forget this too. You are my wife. No one is going to take you away from me and I will never give you a reason either. I hugged her tightly and kissed her. We fell asleep, but before I fell asleep, I was lying, staring at the ceiling. The strange events of this evening kept coming back to me, and I had to call Carlo first. The next morning, Connie got up and headed to the gym for her morning workout, while I hung around the house, drinking glass after glass of orange juice to clear my head. I sat down at my laptop and googled the hotel that was written on the pen I saw in her purse. The search ended and I checked the location. It was on the other side of London from us, but easy to get to. There was parking on site. It actually looked very chic. I wrote down the phone numbers and email address anyway, but saw that they also had the option to book online. I would have to check the history to see if there was anything there. I checked nothing, nothing at all. History has been completely erased. I smelled another rat. My paranoia was getting out of control. I called Carlo. Carlo, this is Sal. So what's going on with Phil and Terry? I have the impression that you know something. Should I worry? Sal, meet me at my brother's bar around noon, then I'll tell you everything I know. It's better not to do this over the phone. Fine? Of course I'll be there. Sal, come alone. Fine. Um... Yes, of course, I understand. The connection was interrupted. Now I was concerned. Should I have done this? Damn it, I was worried. I sat there staring at the phone as my stomach slowly began to twist. I didn't like the feeling I had inside. Connie burst through the door about an hour later. She looked refreshed. Her hair was still damp from the shower, and there was a blush on her cheeks. Good training? I asked. Yes, it was great. I needed this release. She threw her purse on the table and her sports bag on the floor. I'm going to visit Carlo later. He wants to talk about something else, but it shouldn't be too long. What does he want, Sal? You know, sometimes he still gives me goosebumps, even though he's a cute cat. Yes, he's a great guy. But I, for one, would never want to be on his side. And don't ever confuse him with a cat. I won't be long, darling, okay? Connie gave me another look that I couldn't read. What the hell is going on? Everyone around me is emitting vibes that are starting to bother me. I got into my car and drove slowly across town to Brother Carlo's house, a large, nondescript building that housed a chic and trendy bar in North London. 
well, not exactly a regular bar, but more of a members-only drinking club, or at least for those in the know. Before I could press the bell, the door opened and Carlo stepped aside to let me in, while he quickly looked outside, as if checking if I was being followed. I watched him with curiosity. Okay, Carlo, what the hell is going on? Your call scared me, and due to several other events that have happened, I'm starting to worry. I don't know what, if anything, to worry about. He looked me in the eyes and said, Follow me. I followed him through the bar into the back rooms, where there was an office set up like an office. He closed the door behind me and we sat down on either side of the large oak table. Sal, you are very dear to me, so I want you to listen to me carefully. I promised your old man that I would always look out for you. I don't break my word. What I tell you will hurt, but you have to listen to me. Fine? I shuddered internally when I saw the pain in his eyes. My mind began to run through the possibilities, but deep down, I knew it had something to do with my wife. My heart was pounding wildly in my chest. This man has been close to me all my life. I knew that my father was as close to him as if he were his own son. He was a cousin, but lived with us since childhood. I didn't know much about his parents, except that they were killed together. My father immediately responded and took him in. From then on, he was my brother. He opened the top drawer of the desk he was sitting at, pulled out a large manila envelope, and carefully slid it across the desk toward me. My eyes were glued to it, as if it were a poisonous snake ready to bite. I instinctively knew that when I opened the envelope, my life would change forever. As I slowly reached for the snake, Carlo's hand fell on it. Startled, I looked up and saw the pain in his eyes again. This is bad, isn't it? He looked at me and held my gaze. A slight nod was all he gave me. Sal, remember that I'm here for you. Fine. He raised his big hand, and I pulled the snake towards me. I picked it up and felt its heaviness. It seemed so filled with poison. Carlo watched me as I removed the contents from the hiding place inside the envelope. Once it was opened, the poison became visible and began to affect my mind and heart. I've seen the photographs, large glossy shots of a woman and a man having sex. They were easy to identify. They were photographed in various poses in what appeared to be a cheap hotel room. There were others, clearly taken at a different time and in a more normal environment. When I looked through a veil of tears, I could see my wife naked on our own bed with this man. Sal, Sal, are you okay? I continued to look through the photos, each one piercing my heart. The pain in my chest intensified as I watched my marriage disintegrate before my eyes. I looked up at Carlo, and my face was wet with burning tears. What? How? When did you do this? Who is he? My eyes widened with shock, fear, and a considerable amount of anger, which is also boiling. Sal, a few weeks ago I heard whispers that Connie was up to something. I didn't have any proof until a couple of days ago, just before we all went out the other night. I know some things for sure, but there are still things I'm working on as for how to do it. A friend of mine recognized her when he saw her in a restaurant in South London. He thought the guy she was with was too friendly to treat a married woman like that in public. Sal, they thought they were out of the area and I think they were safe. Who he is, is Tony Drew. Yes, you should know him. He's Phil's brother. I sat rooted to the spot when his words began to dawn on me. Images of our evening out flashed through my head. Glances from Phil and Connie, and then from Terry. Everything was coming together. I found a pen from a hotel on the other side of London. Is that where they are? Yes, Sal. I'm sorry, mate, but my boyfriend followed them there early last week. As far as I understand, they stayed overnight. The first meeting also took place when you were not at home. I looked at him and now my heart was hardened and my fist clenched tightly into a ball. I'm going to kill this bastard, I spat. Calm down, Sal. This could get you in a lot of trouble, and she's not worth doing time for, and neither is he. Divorce this bitch and get rid of her yourself and let me deal with him. No, Carlo. No matter how much I respect you, I cannot allow this. I need to deal with this bastard myself, 
and he needs to know it was me, too. He is married. Do you know where he lives, works, and everything? I do have some information in the envelope that will answer that question, but don't do anything rash. We need to plan everything carefully, and we don't want to get thrown in jail either, do we? He is not married, but as far as I can tell, he is divorced. He has no children, but he like his woman, especially married ones. Maybe he doesn't want any commitment or something like that. He shouldn't have peed in our pond anyway. What he will still regret. His eyes grew cold when he said this. I had no doubt that this would not end well for my wife's lover. So what's on your mind? I was still breathing heavily and rapidly, but I was gradually controlling my rage, at least as much as I could. He poured me a glass of whiskey before answering. How well do you get along with your friend Phil? The reason I ask is because he was acting a little strange at the restaurant with Terry and your wife, too. I watched him. I think he knows what's going on. If so, can you call him friend anymore? I saw it, too. I'm wondering if his wife is involved, too, judging by the way they acted. I don't see any point in hanging around here any longer than necessary, Sal. I think we should pull the trigger as soon as possible, but before we do, you need to talk to your lawyer about this. That is... Do you want to get rid of her, or are you going to try to achieve reconciliation with her? If it was a one-time thing, then maybe. But seeing this, I just can't go through with it. This is all too much. These pictures will pop up in my memory every time I look at her. No, I can't forgive or forget. I understand, but in that case, you need to start protecting yourself now. It may take some time, but if you first plan this, then at least you'll get some bang for your buck, and trust me, you need it. I need to think about this, Carlo. I want them both to suffer. At least, damn it, they also really suffered. He leaned forward and placed a business card in front of me. A guy who deals with divorces. He is ruthless, and he takes no prisoners either. Strictly labels them and packs them in bags. No riots. I've already briefed him on your situation. All you have to do is call him and say, go, and he will take care of it. Trust me, he's doing well. He is also my cousin. He laughed at that. We had cousins everywhere. I couldn't help but smile. We sat for another hour until we came up with a plan of action. I called my cousin Carlo and he took action. We agreed not to serve it until everything was ready. In the meantime, I needed to find out to what extent Phil and his wife Terry were somehow involved in this matter. I left Carlo and drove slowly back to the house. My agitated brain fought to maintain control of my sanity. I gripped the steering wheel so tightly that I'm sure my fingers left dents in it. I parked my car and trudged to the door. But when I walked inside, I didn't hear a sound at all. Connie has gone somewhere. I found a note on the kitchen table, and it said, I'll go see Terry. I'll be back later. Love you. I crumpled it up and threw it in the trash. I called Carlo. She says she went to see Terry. I know Phil and Terry have her now, but Terry isn't there, only Phil. I have a guy who is keeping an eye on her, just like we agreed. He will stay with her as long as we need him. Of course, so where is Terry then? That is, if she was the one she was going to meet. If anything turns up, Sal, I'll let you know on your cell phone. I sat down and looked at my watch. Three hours later, Connie returned home. Hello, my love. How was your day? She rushed into the room and kissed me on the cheek, heading towards the kitchen. Everything was okay. Carlo had something he wanted to discuss with me, that's all. But we are working on a plan to deal with this. She looked at me, expecting me to tell her some details, but I didn't. I wanted her to ask. A minute later, she did just that. It's just a personal matter with my cousin that needs to be sorted out. He thinks his wife is cheating on him, so he really needed some advice. I smiled, noticing how her expression changed as she tried to maintain her casual smile. But I'm sure everything will work out. She turned away, but I still knew I scared her a little. The rest of the weekend passed slowly. I couldn't bring myself to have sex with her, no matter how much I wanted to. I kept looking at the pictures that Carlo showed me of her and that bastard Tony. I couldn't understand how she could do this to him and act normal around me. She was a much better liar and actress than I ever thought possible. Saturday night was fine, but Sunday night she came to me, 
and I could tell from her body language that she wanted sex. Sal, I need us to make love tonight. I know you've been busy, but I need you now. Do it, please. She whined. I did what I had to do. We didn't make love, we had sex. We collapsed on the bed, exhausted. We lay on our backs, breathing heavily. What happened, Sal? We've never done this before. She looked a little shocked. I'm not sure. I just wanted to make sure you were mine. I think I love you, Connie, and I don't want to lose you, so I decided to do something new that I thought might help. You won't lose me, silly. I'm all yours, darling. I kissed her lightly on the lips as her words tore my heart. I also had an image of her and Tony. So how could she be completely mine? Fucking lying woman. We lay quietly in our bed, each with our own thoughts. I felt violated and betrayed that Connie could lie to me the way she did. I was angry and getting angrier by the minute. I slipped out of bed as soon as she fell asleep and went downstairs. I poured myself a large JD and sat down at my computer. I saw a pop-up message from Carlo. I checked the time. It was a little after one in the morning. All the wheels are turning and everything is in its place, just as we discussed. Okay. I figured all I have to do now is schedule a short absence for Wednesday and we'll get started. I replied to him with a message. Okay. An hour later, I slipped back into bed. I tried to sleep, but the rage wasn't helping me. I eventually dozed off and managed to get a few fitful hours of not very good sleep. I crawled out of bed and showered before getting dressed and heading downstairs. Connie greeted me with a smile and breakfast, coffee and toast. This morning she moved a little unsteadily. She noticed me looking and smiled. You were a little wild last night, love. I don't think I'll be ready for the next round for a few days. She put her arms around my neck and kissed me again. I choked and she stepped back. It's okay. I smiled through a cough. It just went down the wrong throat. She sat down and took a sip of coffee. I have to go to Leeds on Wednesday. Will you be okay? She looked at me over her cup and I could almost see her brain working. Just for one night? She asked casually. Yes, but I won't be back until late on Thursday evening. Does this have something to do with Carlo? Yes, and that cousin I told you about. Nothing special, really, but he could use some support. Carlo gives me goosebumps, although I'm not sure what kind of support he would offer. You'd be surprised at what a good friend he can be, but I wouldn't want to be on his bad side, related or not. He also has a talent for solving problems. I saw her face turn slightly pale, but her mind was still working on the plan, and I saw it. I looked at my watch and stood up, getting ready to leave for the day. I need to go, honey. See you later and behave while I'm gone. Before she could get up, I kissed the top of her head and walked through the door into the garage. I pulled out of the garage and drove down the road, purring. I went to meet with my lawyer and spent an hour with him discussing options and signing his papers. He was on a roll and had already received copies of the contents of the envelope. He confirmed that he would have everything ready by Wednesday afternoon for me to pick him up. I ran to the bank and transferred all the money from our savings to a new account in my name only, and also sent a large sum to Carlo to hold on my behalf as well. The current account was left as is, it covered all bills, so there was practically no free cash on it. I emptied our safe deposit box of cash and jewelry and opened a new account, in my name only at a different bank. I also stopped paying her benefits, which went into her own account. I was sure it would hit her quickly, and she would be in trouble by the end of the month. Satisfied, I went to my office and went about my daily routine. My secretary Sadie was a great help, and I knew she could run the ship without me, and, it seemed to me, I would have handled it much better. In between signing papers, I caught her eye on me. I sighed and turned my chair so that I was directly facing her. I knew her for almost five years. She was always a professional and was selflessly devoted to me, to the point that it felt like she was protecting me. She was always polite and cold to Connie, but I was sure there was some kind of secret current between them. Connie mentioned how she felt about her a few times, but I always brushed it off as a girl problem between them. I looked at her oval face. Her piercing, dark blue eyes looked at me with concern. 
I knew I had to say something. I felt the need to say something to someone. I was torn inside, and she knew it. I took a deep breath, trying to collect my thoughts and control my emotions. Sadie, there are things going on this week that may cause some disruption, so if I'm not around, you know what to do to keep things going as normal. Fine? Yes, boss. You can rely on me. May I help you? Sadie was a married woman in her forties, smart and elegant, whom I trusted implicitly. I looked at her, and she seemed to read my deepest thoughts. Connie is cheating on me. She's cheating on you. Oh my God, Sal, this is terrible. Are you sure? I mean, do you really know? I just nodded slowly. She saw the tears returning to her eyes and closed the distance between us. She hugged me tightly, standing next to me. I felt the love of this woman in those arms, and I knew that was what was missing at home. I cried for the first time since I found out a few short days ago. She hugged me until I managed to pull myself together again. She took my face in her hands and looked into my eyes. Sal, you are a good person. Don't let anyone tell you differently. What are you going to do? I guess get a divorce and kick that bastard's ass too? Well, yeah, something like that. But I don't want to get you or anyone else involved, Sadie. Please understand. Don't do anything stupid, Sal. Please be careful. The rest of the day turned out to be really hard. But Sadie was worth her weight in gold. Judging by the way she took care of me, her husband is a lucky man. She fought off all comers and simply dealt with any crap in her inimitable manner. I heard her say to someone at one point, Just fuck off. I smiled at this. It was so good to have such good people like her next to me. At home, I was sitting with Connie watching TV when the phone rang. She walked out into the hallway to answer. I heard her talking quietly, but not enough to make out what was going on. About five minutes later, she returned. What's happened? I asked curiously. Oh, nothing. It's just that Terry, as usual, keeps saying that he and Phil are having another disagreement over trifles. I just want them to either make up or break up. They drive me crazy. What do you mean? Are they in big trouble? Phil never mentioned this. I watched her face, looking for something that might give her away. Well, actually, I think it's something and nothing special. I'm sure they'll sort it out. Is this what happened when we were in the restaurant? Connie looked at me nervously. She didn't know that I noticed something between them and her participation in it, too. Now that she had started this series of lies and stuck with it, I inwardly smiled at her discomfort. But I still couldn't figure out what Terry and Phil's role in all of this was, unless it was somehow unrelated. Yes, they had an argument before leaving, and then it kind of simmered all evening. Is this what you did with Phil? She visibly shuddered. I mean, tried to help them sort out their argument? Yes. Terry asked me to talk to Phil, that's all. So, what was there? Maybe I can help. I mentally smiled, watching as my wife began to tie herself in knots. It's okay, Sal. I'm sure they have almost everything figured out by now. Okay. Glad to hear that. I don't like the idea of my friend's marriage being in trouble. He doesn't cheat, does he? No, no, nothing like that. Now her face turned red. So it was Terry who was playing with someone nearby? Look, Sal, I don't know. Okay, let's mind our own business and leave them alone, she snorted. Exactly my thoughts. But I can tell Phil about it when I see him. Just to see if he's okay. Her eyes narrowed as I looked back at the TV, apparently ending the conversation. A few minutes later... I asked her casually. So, if neither of them are cheating, and Terry asked you to talk to Phil, what was that about? Sal, for Christ's sake, leave it alone. She jumped up from the sofa and ran out of the room. I leaned back in my chair, giggling. I know that now I have touched a nerve with her. All I needed to find out now was what the other couple's role was in this. We spent the rest of the evening carefully avoiding each other. This seemed to satisfy both of us, and very little was said. I decided that tomorrow I would drop by Phil and Terry's and steer their pot a little. Of course it was dangerous. This might have told my wife that I knew what was going on, 
but I couldn't help but tug at their mustache a little. The next day, Tuesday, I got up early and headed toward the door as Connie came down the stairs. She was still sleepy, but I politely kissed her on the cheek as I passed her on the way to the garage. I can't stop, my love. We need to move. I have a lot to do before leaving tomorrow. Love you. Connie stood there looking stunned until I was out the door, and a few seconds later she heard my car pull out of the driveway and speed down the road. After pouring herself some coffee, she sat and thought about Tony. Everything was so great until the last week or so. She met Tony one evening a few months ago while she was out with Terry. They were in a small club with a couple of other friends when he walked in. Seeing his daughter-in-law, he approached the group and, smiling, offered to buy them all a drink. All the girls smiled at the handsome guy as he looked around at them all. Terry noticed that Tony and Connie made eye contact and something flashed between them. Stay away from Tony. He's a real piece of shit. He even hit on me before. He hunts anyone with a pulse, especially married ones. Don't worry, Terry. I have my Sal. But he's a pretty nice-looking guy. Didn't you have the slightest temptation? Terry shook her head, looking at her friend. One word, don't. Terry fulfilled her duty as a friend, but she saw something in her friend's eyes that she did not like. The rest of their evening passed without incident, at least as far as she could see. However, Tony cornered Connie and stuck her with his phone number. Over the next few days, Tony somehow managed to get Connie's number, called a couple of times, and spent a few innocent minutes chatting and flirting. By the time of her next bachelorette party, she knew Tony would be there again. There was a bit of dancing this time, and once Tony had her in his arms, he began working on seducing her. He showered her with flattery and compliments, lots of little touches as they chatted. It was only when Terry grabbed her elbow that she realized that she had spent the entire evening with him. She left the club with her friend, who scolded her harshly and urged her to stop before anything bad happened. Connie still didn't listen and brushed off her warning, saying that nothing had happened anyway. Tony smiled as Terry led her away. He wanted Connie, and sooner or later he would have her. He was sure of it. Over the next few weeks, the phone calls became regular, the flirting intensified, and the seduction of Connie began in earnest. Everything changed when Terry had to give up their regular night outs, and Tony saw an opportunity during one of their calls. He managed to convince Connie to meet him alone at the club, just as friends, of course. Connie thought about it, and now that the opportunity presented itself, she jumped at it and agreed to meet him all too quickly. She couldn't stop it, and she didn't want to, anyway. She had been chatting with Tony, and they seemed to have developed a relationship, and now she was ready to take it to the next level. She blushed thinking about it this way. Maybe some kissing or cuddling, maybe, who knows? Grabbing her purse, she almost skipped towards the front door. That night was the first, and from then on, it was inevitable that there would be more. They had a passionate evening filled with flirting, touching, dancing, and then kissing. Tony was a master seducer. He led her to his car and drove her to the Marriott. Once in the room, he continued his advance, and they had sex. Connie almost panicked when she saw the time, and rushing to clean up and get dressed, she begged Tony to take her home as soon as possible, since it would take at least another 30 minutes anyway. She sent Sal a message that she was waiting for a taxi and would be home soon. That night was a real nightmare for Connie, but when she came in, Sal was already asleep, so she climbed into bed and hoped that in the morning, everything would pass. A restless night followed but her body still burned and tingled with every thought of Tony possessing her. She couldn't help but smile to herself. It was so exciting. Over the next few weeks, Connie went to parties to meet Tony, and also saw him during the day whenever she could. During Sal's business trip, she spent the night with Tony at a hotel. It was a night filled with sex. They did their best. He mentioned it several times, but Connie was always reserved. But his constant pressure as well as copious amounts of alcohol, eased her conscience. Terry found out what Connie was doing a few weeks later and warned her friend to stop before she was caught. She even had a fight with her husband Phil about it and wanted him to pressure Tony to stop before it all came out. Terry told Connie to cool down and that she had spoken to Tony and also asked Phil to intervene as well. 
Tony was unrepentant, arrogant, and disdainful of Terry and his brother. Phil was torn between his loyalty to his brother and his friend Sal. It didn't help when Connie started reprimanding him in a restaurant when he asked her to stop dating his brother because he got it in the neck from his wife. He was trapped between a rock and a hard place, from which there was no easy way out. The longer this went on, the more difficult it was to find a way out without causing serious problems. Connie knew it had to end soon, and she knew the risks she was taking only made it more appealing to continue. It was dangerous. If Sal ever found out, all hell would break loose. The restaurant scene was a little too intimate for comfort, and when Sal asked what was going on, things definitely got out of hand. She sat sipping coffee, replaying her novel in her head. She felt her excitement at the thought of Tony. There was just something so special about him. She knew that he didn't love her and didn't want to see anything in her other than light pleasure, but she was still drawn to him. She decided that tomorrow everything would end, and this would be the last time. She had to put an end to this, but they would have one more night together. She somehow felt better that the decision had been made, but of course she still had to convince Tony, too. It was late when I walked in the door. I had been trying to kill time all day and all the plans were made. The documents from my lawyer were now in my car. The official kit will be delivered by registered mail. I felt the tension and headed straight for my trusty bottle of JD and poured a large drink. Connie watched me as I took a long sip and poured more. I was confused and looking at Connie. I was sure that she was also dealing with her own problems. Are you okay, Sal? I didn't answer at first, taking another sip of my JD. I turned around and fixed my gaze on her. I could see her reaction. She looked scared, worried, and the trembling that ran through her body was almost unnoticeable. It's just a hard day. That's all love is. I need to take a shower, and then I need to get ready for my conversation with Carlo tomorrow. I slipped past her and up the stairs before she realized I hadn't kissed her. She didn't like this atmosphere. It scared her, and she knew why too, but tomorrow it would be over. What did I mean when I said I should prepare for tomorrow? She realized that she no longer knew anything about what I was doing. I stood under the hot streams of water and tears flowed from my eyes because of my marriage, my wife, my future. Everything was so messed up. After 30 minutes in the shower, I didn't feel any better, although I was cleansed. My heart was breaking into pieces and I wanted to run and hide. I was shaking, and I wasn't sure I could control myself for long. Stepping out of the shower, I dried myself off and dressed casually before heading downstairs. Connie looked at me as I walked into the kitchen. I pulled myself together and now had my game face on. She relaxed a little as she pulled herself together as well. I saw it. It was strange. We both knew something was wrong, and we both did our best not to ask questions that could ruin everything. What are we having for dinner? I ask it as casually as possible. I thought we could order something for a change. I don't feel like cooking today. Sure, no problem. Is Chinese okay? Yes, it would be nice. I called, and while we waited, we sat in the living room with the TV warbling in the background. Like two prize fighters, we looked at each other, not drawing attention and not wanting to enter into the confrontation that was in the air. Dinner was quiet, almost tense. What time do you have to leave in the morning? She asked casually. I leave around 9 a.m. We have a flight booked at 11, so we don't need to rush. It won't take too long, although the problem is that we won't be able to face this problem until tomorrow evening. But in any case, it will be nice to finally meet Kausen Carlo. You know what family is. It was almost 10 p.m. and I thought I saw her glance at her watch. I need to go to bed. Tomorrow will be a long day. I stood up, drained my glass, and put it on the table. I looked at her across the table, and it seemed to me that a shadow of sadness flashed in her eyes. She stood up and closed the distance between us. I want you to know, Connie. I have always loved you like no other. I hugged her tightly. She felt him hug her and her heart filled with sadness and guilt. Tomorrow it will all be over, she thought to herself.
and then I can make amends to him. I was thinking about the same thing. Almost, I woke up to the aroma of freshly brewed coffee filling my nostrils, which I always loved first thing in the morning. It brought back memories of my grandmother's house where coffee was always ready, also strong and dark. I floated down the stairs towards the strong aroma of nectar. Connie was waiting with a large mug in her hand. I grabbed it and kissed her cheek before taking a sip of the buttery drink that helped me wake up completely. I sat down and ate some toast, citing my rather full stomach from yesterday's meal. Silence reigned in the kitchen while we drank coffee. Each of us watched the other, but turned away so as not to be noticed. It was intense, and we both wanted it to be over. I looked at my watch. I need to go, love. I need to be at Carlo's to pick him up. I got up and put my cup on the drying table, having previously emptied it. I felt myself breathing deeply, and a wave of emotion rose in my chest. I suppressed a sob as I almost lost her. I looked at Connie and saw that she was trying to keep her cool. Damn, that was intense. She must understand that I know for sure. She looked up at me, smiling as I walked past her. Have a nice trip and come back soon, Sal. She watched as I brushed past her and kissed her politely on the forehead. And again, the action puzzled her. I grabbed my travel bag and headed to the garage. Letting out a huge sigh of relief, I inserted the key into the ignition and turned it on. The car roared for a moment. The garage door lifted, and I easily backed out into the cool morning air. With tears slowly blurring my eyes, I turned the steering wheel and drove the car down the road away from my wife. I haven't looked back. I could not. My face was wet with tears, and sadness weighed heavily on my heart. This was it. Judgment Day. Connie picked up the phone a few minutes later and listened to the dial tone in her ear. He left. Are you still ready for tonight? Oh yeah, baby, definitely. We'll make this a good night, too. I had to tell Phil to fuck off, although Tony, he's been getting on my nerves lately. Did he say anything to you? Yes, but I also sent him to hell and his wife, too. She also pestered me. She won't say anything, although she knows it. Well, that won't stop us, baby. I'm really looking forward to tonight. I asked my friend to book us the same room as before, so we are ready to meet. Room 415, just get the key from the front desk and I'll see you there at 8, okay? Understand very well. I'll call you back later. The couple hung up and the man smiled. He typed out a text detailing the lover's rendezvous before picking up his listening equipment and leaving his post. Carlos saw the message and smiled darkly at Sal. Sitting in his office, he cringed at his wife's callousness before discussing the plan for the evening. Are you sure you want this, Sal? I have to ask before things go too far. You know how this ends, don't you? I looked at my lifelong friend, seeing the deep concern in his eyes, and heard the warning in his words. Carlo, I loved this woman as I have never loved anyone before, and will never love again. I gave her everything I had, and I can't just leave it. I have to do something to let her know what she did and that she will pay for it forever. Just like her lover. I just have to do it, Carlo. You understand? Carlo nodded sadly, seeing the pain in Sal's eyes and feeling it in his words. Ready to go, Sal? Sal nodded. Okay, we have some time, so let's go eat and I'll fill you in on things. At one point, I thought about calling Terry and Phil to find out how much they knew and ask why they didn't mention it to me. I would leave them alone. If they get you now, you'll be giving the police evidence of motive before the fact. Leave them alone for now. There will be time later. Don't worry. They walked to the bar and Sal was introduced to Carlo's brother, Alfredo. Nice to finally meet you, Sal. He smiled and shook his hand. The three men sat and chatted amiably before the waitress walked in carrying plates of food that had obviously been prepared in advance without saying a word. The young waitress smiled at Sal and leaned over and said before turning around, Hello, Sal. My Uncle Carlo told me a lot about you. Nice to meet you. I'm Alicia. Alfredo smiled at Selk and led his daughter away. Sal, I'm sorry about my daughter's impetuosity. She's as stubborn as they get these days. Alfredo, 
It's a pleasure to meet you and any member of your family. For too long, we have missed the opportunity to come together. Family is everything, as I'm sure you know. Please say hello to your wife and the rest of your family for me. Alfredo smiled. Thank you. I'll do that. Lunch passed slowly, with the customers entering one after another and creating a warm hubbub behind them. Considering what they were discussing, it was surreal, but also strangely relaxing, as Sal felt at ease and safe. His cell phone rang just after three in the afternoon. He looked at the screen and saw that it was Connie. Hi, Connie, how are you? I called to find out if everything is okay there. How is Carlo and his little problem? We're both fine, thanks for asking. We're here for a late lunch before moving on. What have you planned for tonight, my love? He asked this question as usual, but at the same time he wanted to hear her lie again. I'm going to visit Terry. I think everything is fine there now. This is good. I was going to call Phil later anyway. I think he will be out this evening with his brother, I understand. I've never met him. What is he like? Oh, well, I only met him once. Anyway, he seems pretty nice from what I could tell. Really looks a bit like Phil. I have to run, Connie. We need to check into the hotel before our meeting this evening. So have a nice evening and say hi to Terry. Okay, darling, love you. Bye, baby. Bye. When he disconnected the call, Carlo looked at him and saw pain, but also something else. Anger. Deep, burning anger. Something he knew very well, and the only thing that set him on the path he chose in life until he met Joan, and she did something to him that had never happened before. She made him fall in love with her. Is everything okay, Sal? Yeah, looks like we're ready to go. The men raised their glasses and toasted each other, draining their glasses in one gulp. It's time to get some rest before the show starts. Let's go meet the guys. They left Alfredo at the bar and headed to the private quarters. There they met a group of four men who greeted them by shaking Sal's hand and giving Carlo a big hug. Sal, these are my very good friends. I trust them with my life and have done so many times in the past. They won't let you down. Looking at the men, I saw that they were all several years older than me and looked beaten by life. They all had the same steely eyes and they seemed strong and focused. I felt a shiver run through me as reality began to sink in. Still want it, Sal? Carlo asked coldly. Yes, I don't just want this. I need it. I looked at the men, who all smiled slightly at me, as if they also understood the importance of this for me. Okay, guys, is everything ready? Has everything been checked? Are the cars there? Van? Access to the hotel and escape route? Disposal? For the next 30 minutes, the plan and all the points Carlo had mentioned were discussed until everyone was convinced that it was safe to go. I felt their eyes on me as I paced back and forth across the room. I was tense and felt anger building inside. I wasn't sure I could control it for long. The knowledge that Connie was even now preparing to meet Tony turned me inside out. I wanted to hit something, someone. Carlo stood in front of me, blocking my path, and wrapped his big arms around me. Easy, Sal, easy. We'll hit the road soon, and things will get easier, son. Tears welled in my eyes as disappointment and anger mixed with feelings of betrayal and loss fueled my mood. Carlo walked next to me, and the men looked at me. I felt their sympathy wash over me, as if in some form of support. They all took turns talking and walking around with me for the next hour, as they too needed me to play my part to the fullest. The phone rang, breaking the mood. Heads turned towards the piercing sound. Carlo took out his mobile phone. Yes? They all strained to hear something. Okay, okay. We're leaving in five minutes. I looked at my watch. It was already past eight o'clock. Time just flew by. The men left the room and headed to their car. They were planning to take a van closer to their destination. Carlo looked at Sal. He was alarmed. Sal, last chance you don't have to do this, you know. Yes, I know. This bastard disrespected me and my family. 
I need to teach him a lesson he'll never forget, and I sure as hell intend to do just that. Good man. Carlo clapped me on the shoulder with a meaty hand as we walked out the back door and got into the parked Mercedes that had been specially ordered for us. This brings me to where I am now, parking the Mercedes on a side street less than 200 meters from the hotel. We sat in silence when, just after 9 p.m., a message arrived on Carlo's phone. He looked at it and nodded at me. They have arrived. I felt my heart drop. Carlo saw my reaction. His hand on my shoulder now kept me in touch with reality and tried to distract me from the thoughts in my head. Let's stick to the plan, Sal. I looked at him and nodded. I knew we would have to wait at least another hour before moving in. Another message arrived. The boys are here and in position. Carlo smiled nervously at me. Their role was crucial in getting us into the hotel unnoticed, or at least as discreetly as possible. We sat down and discussed what we needed to do, and Carlo again reminded me not to let my emotions get out of control. We don't want to cause a riot and get into shit because of these two idiots. His cold eyes glared into mine as he looked at me. I took the hint, and now was not the time to spoil things. Okay, Carlo, I won't shoot that bastard in bed. I'm not that stupid. I grinned at him as he slapped me on the head. Don't make me mad, Sal. This is some serious shit. Pull yourself together and control yourself, got it? I nodded. We sat in silence until another message appeared on his mobile phone. We are inside. The exit is guaranteed. Carlo looked at the clock on the dashboard. It was almost time. My heart began to speed up and my breathing followed suit. Carlo took the brass knuckles out of the glove compartment and carefully opened the car door. He saw me looking. Just in case, okay? Let's go. A moment later, I was following him as he headed into the hotel lobby. We walked through the door and headed straight for the elevators, acting as casual as any other resident, but avoiding eye contact. I tried my best to relax and stay cool, but I was tense as hell. We stood and waited for the elevator to descend to the first floor. The elevator dinged and the doors slowly opened. We had to stand aside as a couple exited the elevator before we went inside and stood impassively as the doors closed. We watched in silence as the floor indicator needle slowly rose towards the fourth floor. We arrived too quickly and the doors opened slowly. Now my heart was racing. Carlo came out first and led me into the room. I saw the number 415 on the door and realized that my wife was on the other side of that door with another man. As we approached the door, the other four guys appeared seemingly out of nowhere. They were wearing what appeared to be hotel-style uniforms and were pushing one of the laundry carts. There were slight differences in that they were all wearing wool caps that I knew could easily be pulled down to avoid being recognized, and I also knew that at least one had a stun gun. I looked around and didn't see anyone in the corridor. Carlo also pointed out the CCTV cameras, which had been neutralized, and we estimated that we had about five minutes before anything was noticed as unusual. We stepped aside when the guys stood in front of the door. One guy handed the key card to the door lock, and we all saw the green light turn on and heard the door click. The door opened slowly. We already knew the layout of the room and that the bedroom was at the end of a short corridor next to the living room. We quickly headed to the bedroom as we passed through the living room. I recognized the underwear and dress on the floor. My heart sank even more, and my chest tightened as I realized that I had seen it all before. We walked silently to the open bedroom door. We could all hear the moans of a couple having vigorous sex. My face was flushed and all the guys were avoiding eye contact, but I felt their sympathy. They were professional and focused. The plan was that the guys would go in first and get the bastard out of the room as quickly as possible, and then I would face the bitch face to face. Carlo led the guys into the bedroom. The lights were on and only dimly illuminated the room. But from where I stood, I could see what they were doing. The damn couple didn't hear or see the men enter the room. In the end, it was the roar of a laundry cart that did it. The noise made Tony turn his head slightly and his eyes widened as he realized there were other people in the room. He was taken out of the room. Everything happened so quickly. We slipped down the stairs and used the exit at the back of the hotel to disappear back into the dark city. 
A few minutes later, we returned to the car. We didn't talk on the way back. Everyone was busy with their own thoughts. Carlos started the engine and we sped off, heading to the meeting point. We walked into the bar and Alfredo was waiting for us. It was almost 1 a.m., so he poured us some healthy drinks while we sat in front of the fireplace in the back room. Gradually, as the adrenaline subsided, we began to feel like more human beings. I've been in a trance for the past few hours, a state of consciousness in which the real world was removed and where only pain and anger lived. Now we sat in the warmth of the back room and ate in peace. Carlo's phone rang. He read the message and smiled at me. Everything is done and everything has been taken care of. The boys are on their way. I know I can't thank them enough for what they did, but I will never forget that night. Sal, shut up, it's done. Now you have other battles to fight. You need to deal with this woman now. Don't get so soft with me, okay? I certainly understand. Nothing more needs to be said. I remembered that we had left her at the hotel, and I wondered how she would get home and whether she would be able to tell anything about her adventure. Well, I still had the rest of the day to kill before I returned home as planned. Now she knew that I was aware of her actions. But would she say anything or confess? For some reason I doubted this, even knowing and catching her on it. When you are ready, rooms will be ready for both of you. Fatigue seemed to suddenly wash over me as I was shown to my room. I took off my clothes, and Alfredo took them and threw them away before I collapsed on the bed. It was not easy to fall asleep as I replayed the events of the previous night and everything that led up to it in my head. I also thought about Connie and the last time I saw her. I was filled with sadness and disgust at the same time. I've loved this woman for so long. She was everything to me, and now it's all gone. The only thing left was to face her and see how it happened between us. I already had divorce papers. I have arranged for an official copy to be delivered to our home later today. By the time I had to return home, she would have no doubt that I knew. I suddenly had a thought. What if she doesn't come home? Now that she found out that I was at the hotel, she would probably be afraid to return home. Crap. I'd rather call and ask to forward the papers. Maybe to Terry's house? Yes. I was sure she would go there. About seven hours later, Alicia woke me from my uncomfortable sleep. There was a mug of coffee under my nose and she smiled at me. Breakfast time, Sal. You have 30 minutes. Carlo said you have an afternoon flight to catch, so it's time to get up. Your change of clothes is on the dresser. She patted me on the shoulder and left the room. I slowly pulled myself upright and got dressed. When I looked in the mirror, I saw a face that I thought I knew. But it had changed. It changed me. Last night I nearly killed a man and watched as he was led away to his fate. But I felt nothing. At this moment, I also did not feel any regrets. Whatever shit happened to Tony was caused by him. I just hoped it would hurt like hell and last a long time. I joined the others at the table and the normality was surreal but calming at the same time. We ate, chatted and even laughed. All too soon it was time to leave. We collected our things and headed to the car. Looking out the window as we drove away, I waved to the faces watching my departure. There was a mixture of pain and deep anxiety in him. It was somehow calming. I mentally promised to return as soon as possible and next time not to leave him for so long. I drove home slowly. The kilometers ticked by and, like a countdown to Armageddon, I felt a growing sense of dread. My anger disappeared for a moment, leaving only a big hole that was filled with love for my wife. I dropped Carlo off and Joanna came out to meet him. She grabbed him as he was getting out of the car and hugged him as if they were newlyweds. I felt a lump rise in my throat as she walked up to me and hugged me tightly. Sal, everything will be fine. Understand this. Tomorrow will come for you. I know things will seem difficult for a while, but trust me, you will be okay. I couldn't speak, but Carlo gave me one of his man hugs, and I was on my way home to face this bitch. Call me later, Sal. I nodded and drove away, trying not to think about anything that made me feel devastated. I inserted my key into the lock and turned it. For some reason, the house seemed empty to me. The heating was turned on, so it was warm in here, but not as cozy. No sounds. It was quiet as I walked carefully into the living room. 
then into the kitchen. Nothing. I looked at my watch. It was already past six, and Connie was supposed to be home. That's if she was trying to save our marriage. I checked my mobile. No calls, no messages. I plopped down in a chair in the living room. What a climax, I blurted out to myself. I felt the anger that had previously been dormant begin to rise within me again, but was now awakening from its imposed sleep. I looked at the photo of Connie and I on the mantelpiece, felt a surge of rage, grabbed it and threw it across the room. The heavy silver frame crashed through the wall and the glass shattered. Fuck you, I shouted. I stared at the wall, breathing heavily, when I heard the phone come to life. I grabbed the phone. Hello, I roared at him. Oh, uh, sorry, I... Is that you, Sal? A female voice asked in a trembling voice. Yes, it's me. What do you want? My tone was loud, direct, and damn angry. Uh, this is Terry, Sal. I... She almost whispered. Yes, Terry. Sorry, you're out of time, that's all. What can I do for you? I breathed more slowly, trying to regain my composure. Well, it's Connie, she's here, and she's actually a little crazy. I can't figure out what happened, but something happened, and she doesn't feel well. She doesn't want to go home. She thinks you might harm her somehow. I don't think she should go anywhere right now, and certainly not drive herself. Terry, is she there? I strongly intervene. Yes, of course it is. Ask her to talk to me. If she doesn't want to, that tells me something and it should be the same with you. Then ask her what happened. Let's see what she says. I heard some muttering and then the voices got a little louder. Terry turned on again. She doesn't say anything. Sal, I'm worried about her. Terry, be patient a little. Just tell her I'll pick her up. Let's see what happens. I heard her tell Connie what I had said, and then Connie's scream was answered enough. Sal, I don't know what to tell you. Terry, I know everything is okay. What do you mean, Sal? I know everything, Terry. Oh my God. I heard Terry relay what I said. Then another howl came through the earpiece, followed by sobs and more screams. Sal, I'm so sorry. Me too, Terry. I know all about it. I know about the bachelorette parties and that you and Phil fought about it. I heard her gasp. Oh my God, no. Yes, I know. While I'm at it, I know who it is too, and when I catch up with that little bastard, he'll pay. Trust me. Sal, I'm so sorry. Phil couldn't convince them to stop. We both tried, and I know we should have told you something. But we ended up in a sticky situation. Terry was now speaking incoherently trying to pronounce all the words as quickly as possible. Terry, rest assured, I don't blame you or Phil for what she did to Tony. I'm just sad that you didn't tell me sooner. I'm afraid this has damaged our friendship. We won't talk about this anymore. Tell Connie I'm not coming for her so she can relax, but her things will be collected sooner rather than later, or they'll go in the trash. I mean everything, too. She doesn't live here anymore. Finally, Today I was supposed to have some papers delivered to me for her. I called the performers and redirected them to your address because I had a feeling that she might run away to you. I think they should be there any minute. Tell this woman to think before she does anything, and especially before she calls me or anyone else. Understood? Okay, Sal. I hung up the phone and exhaled slowly. It was as if I was holding my breath while I spoke. All anxiety easily disappeared from me, and now there was nothing. I said everything I needed to at this point. Now I am calm. I didn't rant or scream at anyone. I felt inside that I wanted this, but I was alone, and she was gone. Maybe she was gone for a while and I didn't notice. I missed this bitch. I hated her and loved her at the same time. I played it over and over in my head. I must have been blind and stupid if I didn't see this coming. The more I thought, the more I saw little signs that all was not well between us. The last few days had worn me out, and as I sat in the empty house, I suddenly felt exhausted. Things had really taken off, and now it was just a matter of time before the real shit started between the two of us. I knew it would get personal and painful. Sooner or later I would have to face this bitch, but right now I was in no condition to fight her. But it would happen soon. There would also be no forgiveness or mercy. I sat down, 
opened a bottle of JD, filled a glass with ice, and poured a decent portion. I took a sip of the dark nectar and savored the taste as it warmed my throat. I took a sip and somehow let my mind go blank, waiting for oblivion or at least some state of mind that would allow me to fall asleep. I slept like the dead. When I woke up, my mouth felt like the bottom of a parrot's cage, and my head was also a little stuffy. I took a shower and went downstairs. I turned on the coffee maker and gulped down the orange juice from the carton. The toast was in the toaster, and I wandered around waiting for the coffee to brew. It was 7.30 when the first bell rang. Hello. Sal, this is Carlo. Are you okay? Sorry it's so early, but I just needed to make sure you were okay and hadn't done anything stupid yet. Yes. I'm fine. Although I have a headache. You don't need to worry. I was calm. She did not return home, but went to Terry and Phil. I talked to her and told her what I knew. So now it's out in the open. I haven't heard anything since last night, about half past seven. I thought I'd eat after she was notified. But judging by Terry's words, she was still a little confused when she arrived. Carlo laughed. Well, it's not really a surprise, but things seem to be going as well as they could be, Sal. I heard from the guys that everything was fine on their part. The parcel was delivered to the Midlands. Although I don't expect to hear anything about this for a day or two, you know what to do. I won't call again until tomorrow as I need to take care of some things today. The family sends their regards to you. I poured myself some coffee and took a sip of the black liquid. This was enough for the alcohol-induced fog in my head to begin to clear. I started thinking about what to do today. I decided to first call my office and check how things were going there, then hire a locksmith and deal with the bank. Screw everything that needed to be done. Even though I didn't want to lose her, I knew I couldn't stay with her because the trust we had was gone. I wasn't going to live on pins and needles, wondering if she was cheating or not. No, this shouldn't have been done. I heard nothing from Connie regarding the papers which I knew were handed to her last night, although I was sure I would hear something today as soon as she came to her senses. Just after nine, there was a quiet knock on the door. Well, that's all, I thought to myself, heading towards the door. I opened the door and saw Terry and Phil standing there. I stood silently, looking at them both. Terry broke the awkward silence. Sal, we should have come to apologize. This is the least we owe you. Can we come in and talk? I stepped back and held the door as they filed inside. I closed the door and pointed towards the living room. They sat down on the sofa together, and I sat in my chair, opposite. Okay, what did you guys want to say? Sal, we're both so sorry. Phil began. Me too, Phil, it's a pity. It's a shame that two people I thought were my friends couldn't tell me that my wife was after some weird asshole. Sorry that my wife felt the need to fuck someone else. Damn, I regret a lot. I felt the anger rising in me again. Sal, we're really sorry. We tried to tell her, well, both of them, but they didn't want to listen. I don't know what she was thinking. She's at our house now, it's still unclear, but it seems like something bad happened yesterday before she came back. Terry begged. What do you mean, Terry? All I know is that I had to leave on Wednesday while the paperwork was being prepared. I couldn't bear to even look at her. I was at a meeting in Leeds, and then you called me. I assume you mean something happened between her and her lover, Tony. I have not yet intended to voluntarily provide any information or disclose my participation. We do not know. We haven't heard anything from my brother, said Phil. I called him, but there was no answer. He's not in his apartment either, and Connie can't tell us where he might be. Damn it, she just blurted out something about being tied up and him leaving her at the hotel. Come on, Phil. She must have said something more. What the hell happened? Obviously something happened. Did that bastard do something to her? I don't give a damn about that, though. I don't care where that piece of shit is, but I'll say this. If I ever see him again, he better hope he lives to regret it. Got me. Now you make sure he knows it, too. Phil and Terry looked at me, stunned by the intensity of my tone. They had never seen me in such a state of rage before. Phil partially understood my words and was clearly shocked by the thought. Anyway, other than that idiot, how is Connie doing? I understand she was given the documents last night. Yes, Sal. After a while, she seemed to calm down. 
but when she was notified, it turned her on again. Sal, she's babbling incoherently, and the words don't make any sense. Whatever happened, it hit her very hard. When she came to us, she was upset, angry, but most of all scared, and she won't say exactly what happened. Okay, I thought. I hope this bitch will now also remember what happened that night, every night. Well, guys, I hate that bitch for what she did to me, so if she's hurting a little right now, that's good, because I'm hurting too. She made her bed with that idiot, so now she can stay with that bastard for all I care. I'm done with her. They looked at me, at a loss for words, for my anger at Connie. Can't you work it out with her, Sal? I mean, she made a mistake, but you had such a good time together. Can't you at least try to make things right? Divorce is a big step, Sal. Please talk to her first. Of course, she deserves at least that. Terry's voice broke as she begged me. I listened, looking into her eyes, which were filled with tears. She was at least showing the emotions of a good friend. I paused, trying to look away from her eyes. I'd always liked Terry, and so did Phil for that matter, and even after the way they'd acted in this mess, I couldn't deny that Terry's words needed to be taken seriously. I knew that sooner or later I would have to sort things out with Connie. Okay, I'll talk to her, but first I want to remove all her things. It will just be her and me. I'll call and let her know when and where. Will this suit you? Terry rushed to me and hugged me tightly. Phil watched in embarrassment. That's all we can ask for, and probably more than she can expect. Yes, Sal, thank you. I'll tell her to wait for your call. Please don't leave her hanging for too long, Sal. It would be cruel. Phil just looked at me with a sullen expression on his face. Sal, I'm sorry, man. My brother is an asshole, and you need to kick his ass real hard. I wouldn't blame you one bit if you did. I watched through the window as the couple drove away. They quickly got into their car and drove off towards my future ex-wife. I sat and thought about what Terry said. It's true, of course I needed to talk to Connie, but I needed to cool down a bit before I could trust myself to be within arm's length of that bitch. I poured more coffee. The strong taste that lingered in my throat was pleasant. After filling another large mug, I picked up the phone, called Sadie, and caught up with her. I spent the next half hour listening to how well Sadie was coping without me. What a woman. Once she was done with that, she started asking me about Connie. God, it was like listening to my mom. As a result, I was ordered to come to her house that evening for dinner with her and her husband, and by the time I hung up the phone, my ears were still ringing. I was convinced that she was at least half Italian. The rest of the day was spent rearranging, Locks, bedrooms, clothes, photographs, whatever came into my head while moving, disassembling, packing, or destroying. My anger, although still uncontrollable, had subsided somewhat towards the end of the day. I sat back in my chair, exhausted from all this emotional trauma, and as I sat there, tears streamed easily down my face. I knew I was probably going crazy without talking to Connie, but subconsciously, I made the decision to get rid of this bitch. Everything was in its place. All that remained was the final showdown. I was under no illusion that it would hurt me as much as it hurt her. How the hell could you do this to me and to us? I sat staring out the window, contemplating the collapse of my marriage. My heart ached, and only pain kept my anger at bay, at least for now. I knew I should have called, but as I sipped some more whiskey, I decided I'd do it in the morning. I'm too tired tonight to go a few hard rounds with this bitch. I wanted to be on my game when I did this. I had another restless night's sleep. I received a call early in the morning, again shortly before 7.30. The phone came to life and bells seemed to ring in my head, waking my brain from the half-sleep I had managed to fall into. Yes? I asked as if by chance. Sal, it's me, Phil. Listen, I just got a call from the hospital. My brother has been there for a couple of days now. He was severely beaten. He seems to be in stable condition, but he was treated really badly. I don't know anything else, so that's it, really. I hope you don't expect any sympathy from me, Phil. As far as I know, he was lucky that he didn't meet me. I will finish the job. Sal, I understand. I wouldn't blame you if you actually did it. So I won't ask this question. He got what he deserved. You are a resilient guy and friend. 
and I just wish I'd been as good a friend to you as you were to me. I know I can't change what's been done, but I just thought you might want to know about Tony. That's all. Phil, it was never your fault. Remember that. It is what it is. Say hi to Terry. Bye, and thanks. Of course, for now. I hung up and stared out the window at the garden. It was quiet there when a strange bird flew up onto the bird table and feasted on the food I liked to prepare for them. Sitting in my chair and watching nature through the glass always calmed me down. It also helped me think, and today was no exception. I used my cell phone to call Carlo and tell him the news about Tony. He just snorted, but noted that it was a job well done. His guys were good and achieved the desired result. He laughed as I ran through the list of injuries that were quite serious but not life-threatening, unless he did something really stupid. Carlo said that he was confident that he could get a message across to him on this matter, just to make sure he behaved, but I didn't think that was wise at the moment. I was sure that Phil would convey my feelings, which would also be better and safer. We left everything as it was, and I returned to contemplating the window. As I sipped my second coffee of the day, the phone rang again and I switched it to voicemail. As I listened, I heard Connie's trembling voice leaving a message. Sal, please call me. We need to talk. I am so sorry. I need to explain. I need you. I need to get home. I am so sorry. There were sobs between the pleas, and with each word my heart squeezed as if it were being suffocated in my chest. I found myself breathing heavily as the message ended. I wanted to pick up the phone, but my hand did not reach the receiver to do so. Even the sound of that bitch's voice could still reach me. I knew I would have to do this today, but I wanted her to wait. So she doesn't think I'm replying to her message. I wandered around the house for a couple more hours, and as I wandered around the house, for some reason it seemed bare and empty. I looked around. Where Connie's things used to be was empty. I called Sadie and asked a couple of guys to come with a van to move all her stuff. Within an hour, the boxes and bags I had packed were stowed in the back of the van. I watched as the van pulled away, heading towards Connie. I knew that very soon my phone would ring as she received her things, and the realization that she had screwed up would hit her hard. It was a one-way trip. The phone rang again, but it was Terry. Sal, Connie's things have arrived. I'm just letting you know that we got them. The guys apparently put most of it in storage. Thanks for this, Sal. All we have is what you have marked as private. Connie is still in shock. I know she called you before. Will you call to talk to her or will you call her later? Connect her to Terry. Let's get this over with. I waited a few seconds until I heard her voice. Huh, hello? A fragile voice came right into my ear. Connie? Oh God, Sal, I'm so sorry. I never wanted... You mean you never thought about getting caught, do you? I spat out venomously. Cell, yeah. Leave it alone, Connie. Now you have answers to all those questions you never thought to ask yourself the entire time you were with that sneaky bastard. Sal, can't we? She started again. Do you really think there's anything you can tell me that will make everything okay? I have all your attention. Can I come home and talk to you? Please? I thought for a few seconds trying to regain control of my emotions. Her voice affected me. I felt my heart twist and turn inside out, as if trying to escape from my chest. My breathing quickened as my mind fought for control. Finally, I took a deep breath. Tonight, here at seven. Whether you come or not, I don't care. This is a one-time offer and only valid until five minutes past eight. I'll listen, but I won't promise anything. I heard her gasp at my impudence and hang up. I leaned back in my chair. Her voice sounded in my head, and I felt the pain in her voice. I wondered if she felt my feelings. I sat back and thought about my marriage, about how happy I thought we were. Of course, we had our ups and downs, but I was convinced that we were happy. And before this bastard, we had no one else. Then I thought, how could I be so sure? Did I really know her at all? I didn't suspect anything before, but that doesn't mean she hasn't done this before. I felt confused again, struggling with what I knew for sure, and that big black cloud that loomed over me, representing everything I sure as hell didn't know. The clock rang in the corridor. I knew that it was already the beginning of seven. 
I listened to the chimes, and they told me that it was indeed 6.45. She'll be here soon. I needed to deal with my emotions and prepare for what was undoubtedly the final act of my marriage. The doorbell rang, interrupted my train of thought, and shook me out of the fog of self-pity I felt I was sinking into. It crept up on me slowly as I tried not to think too deeply about what was about to happen. I started asking questions over and over again. Why? 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 Now I shook off my dark thoughts and stepped towards the door. Opening it, I saw Connie, the first time I had seen her since that night at the hotel. I was shocked. Her hair, although combed and neat, was combed back from her face, giving her a rather gaunt appearance. She wore very little makeup, which emphasized the pallor of her appearance. Her shoulders seemed to slump and droop a little as she walked into the living room. I followed her and noticed how much of a difference a few days make when you are caught off guard, as she was. I watched her as she looked around the living room with quiet sighs, and then a choked sob as she noticed the gaps on the walls and throughout the room where photos and mementos used to be. She looked at me, covering her mouth with her hand, and tears appeared in her eyes. Everything is lost, I said coldly. If you look at the rest of the house, you'll see that there are a lot of empty spaces. I paused before saying anything else. She looked at me again, and now tears were rolling down her cheeks. I didn't understand, Sal. I never wanted this to happen. I didn't think so. I know, but this is the result of your deception, your infidelity, your extramarital sex with another man, all yours. I hope you're satisfied. The words flowed with sincerity and poison. Each word was a direct blow to my soon-to-be ex-wife. She sat down on the couch and I poured her a strong vodka tonic, handing her the glass. I remained expressionless. She took a sip from her glass and looked at me. I swirled the ice in my JD before taking a good sip and leaned back in my chair, looking at her. Okay, Connie, let's hear what you have to say. I'm so sorry, Sal. I couldn't help it. I went too far and then it became a kind of addiction. Connie, just so you know, I spoke to Terry and Phil and they filled in the gaps in my knowledge. I know what and where and also with whom. I just don't know why. I can't answer this question. It was just so new and exciting. I guess I fell for his chatter. But you had sex with him, not once or even twice, but repeatedly for several weeks. I felt the rage rise within me again. I took a sip and a few deep breaths. She looked down at her feet. I know I can't change what I did, Sal. I was wrong. Is there any way we can end this? I avoided answering. What about Tony? What happened to him? Where is this bastard? Connie fidgeted and finally looked up at me. Her eyes bored into mine, and there was some kind of challenge in them while she tried to figure out what to say. That night we were caught at the hotel. There were men there. Five or six, I think. But Tony was just taken away. A minute ago he was there, and then he disappeared. Did you arrange this for Sal? I stared back at her. I took another sip from my glass, looking at her, ignoring her question although I wondered if she somehow knew it was me from her face that night before she passed out. It was terrible. They took him and took him away. Then they tied me up and left. I was afraid that I would die. When I came to my senses, I was alone. She caught a glimpse of the smile on my face as I enjoyed her discomfort. I watched as a shiver ran through her body and our eyes met. So, what happened to your lover? Sal, don't call him that. He is not my lover. Yes, I know that I had sex with him, but I don't have any feelings for him. I love you and only you. You love me so much that you've been having sex with this bastard for several fucking weeks. She pressed herself into the back of the sofa from my sudden and violent outburst. So, okay, tell me why I should give you more of my time. You have already proven that you are a liar and cheater. How do I know that everything you say is true? How the hell do you expect me to believe a single fucking word that comes out of your mouth? Tell me. Tears were now streaming down her cheeks as she began to see and feel for the first time the depth of the anger I held for her. Have you talked to your lover? I asked, deliberately choosing the word lover, knowing that I was getting to her. 
I wanted to embarrass her, make her lose her composure, make that bitch suffer the same way I suffered. She looked at me through her tears. I haven't heard anything about him at all. All I know is that he's in the hospital somewhere. That's all Phil said. I don't want to hear anything about him. He ruined my life. I wish he would die. Well, I couldn't agree more with that, I grinned. I leaned back in my chair, watching her face, and had little doubt that she was now angry about being caught and hung out to dry, and about her ass as well. She had screwed up, and now the whole picture was dawning on her. We sat in silence for several minutes, watching each other and waiting for the conversation to begin. I waited. I had so much pent-up rage that I was afraid to give it free reign. I wanted to slap her, beat her up, use this bitch. I had to stay in control. She looked around the living room again, searching for anything that could change the direction of this conversation. She gasped when she realized our wedding photo was missing from the mantelpiece. As she looked at the empty space, I met her gaze and looked at the dent in the wall to answer her question. She brought her hand to her mouth. She stood up and walked around the room, approaching every empty space. I sat and watched her absorb the missing memories. It was as if all traces of her presence had been removed from the first floor. She sank back onto the sofa. Sal, everything is gone. Is there really no chance? She looked at me and there was defeat in her eyes. I took a deep breath. Connie, I loved you like nothing else. What you did was tear out my heart and trample on it. Having sex with this asshole was disrespectful and showed complete disregard for my feelings and the feelings of our friends. You were seen openly with him. In public, damn it. Don't lie to me that it was just sex or that you didn't want to hurt me. You did it and now you will pay for it. Connie, it's over between us, period. Now, if you'll excuse me, I haven't heard anything from you that would make me change my mind. So if you just sign the divorce papers... Then we can both move on with our lives. I don't want to see or hear from you again under any circumstances. I'm done with you. Now get out of my house. She sat there in complete shock as my words sunk in. She really ruined everything. But now, at that moment, I had no time for her. Anger would help me cope. She gathered herself and stood up to leave, and I followed her to the door. When she opened the door of her car, she looked back at me and mouthed the word, Sorry. I close the door behind her and my marriage. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.